Hello, I'm Jim Turner, owner of the Dr. Pepper Bottling Company of Texas. This year, the Southwest Conference and Dr. Pepper Bottling Company of Texas are once again teaming up to provide fans of the Southwest Conference with a special keepsake that will help you remember the rich traditions, rivalries, and excitement that made the Southwest Conference one of America's great football conferences. Both Dr. Pepper and the Southwest Conference have a long-standing history of excellence in our communities and throughout the state of Texas. In our local markets, the Dr. Pepper Bottling Company of Texas is committed to and involved with such worthwhile causes as the Children's Cancer Fund, the National Paralysis Foundation, the Crystal Charity Ball, the Dallas Black Dance Theater, and the Alzheimer's Association, just to name a few. Our time-honored relationship with the Southwest Conference is just another example of Dr. Pepper's commitment to the people of the great state of Texas. Not only is Waco, Texas, one of our conference school's hometown, Waco is also the birthplace of Dr. Pepper. As a matter of fact, Dr. Pepper is the only major soft drink brand to originate in Texas and call Texas its home. We are proud to present the great days of the Southwest Conference video to the millions of Southwest Conference fans around the country. Dr. Pepper and the Southwest Conference, just what the doctor ordered. Thank you with all my heart for giving me this trophy. You deserve to be number one, and that's what you are. From its inception, the Southwest Conference has survived two world wars, a pair of armed conflicts in Asia, rugged financial turmoil during the Great Depression, and the conflicts and many controversies that make college athletics a unique and entertaining aspect of society over three quarters of a century later. Little did that small group who met on May the 6th, 1914 in Dallas, know that they would leave a legacy spanning eight decades. When this first organizational meeting was held, representatives of the University of Arkansas, Baylor, University of Oklahoma, Rice, Oklahoma A&M, Southwestern, the University of Texas, and Texas A&M formed what was to become the Southwest Conference. A young conference looking to the future, setting the standards and traditions that would span eight decades. A conference which would define sports for many generations to come the nation's fifth oldest was born. In 1915, its first year of competition, the Southwest Conference produced its first basketball championship team, the 1915 Texas Longhorns. Captained by Clyde Littlefield and coached by L. Theo Belmont, this first championship Longhorn team finished 14-0. Later that year, on May the 6th, the first annual meeting of the new conference was held at the YMCA building in Austin, Texas. Intercollegiate rules for basketball were adopted, as were rules governing behavior of players, coaches, and trainers. The following week, the first track meet was held on May the 14th of that same year at the University of Texas in Austin. And on November the 25th, 1950, Oklahoma defeated Oklahoma A&M which would eventually become Oklahoma State to clinch the first Southwest Conference football title. In December of 1915, conference members voted to join the NCAA. From its first sanctioned event in 1915 through today, the Southwest Conference can boast 62 national NCAA and wire service championships. In 1916, the Texas mascot got its nickname when Texas A&M fans rustled the Longhorn. They branded it with the score of the previous year's Aggie victory. Texas partisans recaptured the animal and turned the 13 to nothing brand into Bevo. The nickname has stuck to this day. In 1918, Rice, coached by John Anderson, returned to the gridiron action and Southern Methodist University under the helm of J. Burton Ricks, permanently replaced Southwestern in the conference and sported a record of 4-2-0. In 1919, 
Texas A&M closed a perfect 10-0 season under legendary football Hall of Fame member DX Bible. That year, the Aggies did not allow a point in 10 encounters and joined the 1917 Texas A&M team as the only two teams in conference history to hold all opponents scoreless throughout an entire season. In 1920, Oklahoma withdrew from the conference and was replaced for that one season by Phillips University of Enid, Oklahoma. On November 24, 1921, the first unofficial broadcast of a sporting event of any kind took place when Texas A&M cadets W.A. Doc Tolson and Harry M. Sanders joined electrical maintenance staffer B. Lewis Wilson to produce a wireless account of a nothing-nothing gridiron battle between the Texas A&M Aggies and Texas Longhorns. This was accomplished by telegraphing the play-by-play -play to radio stations in College Station and Austin, who then broadcast the stats to their audiences. Texas Christian University, TCU of Fort Worth, came on board two years later during the 1923 season for the first of 70 Southwest Conference campaigns for the Purple and White. Out of those early years in the Southwest Conference came the league's first individual standouts, including three-year all-conference people like back Gene Davidson of Arkansas and Puny Wilson of Texas A&M, back Jack Mahan of Texas A&M, and center Swede Swenson at Texas. And two real standouts, uh, and Ch uh, Hook McCullough of Texas and back Wesley Bradshaw at Baylor. And also, I should mention, uh, one of the coaches, Frank Bridges of Baylor, who kept the league rule makers on their toes throughout his era at Baylor uh, because of his zany trick plays. Uh, Bridges won the title at Baylor in 1922 and again in 1924 with the exploits of an outstanding three-year-old conference lineman, uh, Sam Coates. And that is important to remember, that 1924 championship, because that is the last football championship that Baylor won in 50 years. Nineteen twenty five marked the departure of Oklahoma AM and, with the cooperation of the Southwest Officials Association, game officials and their specific assignments became part of the conference. On November the twenty fifth, nineteen twenty six, the first actual radio broadcast of a Southwest Conference game hit the airwaves when General Ike Ashburn gave the play by play account of AM's twenty eight to nothing victory over Texas at College Station. 1929, the year that the country will always remember for the stock market crash, had seemingly little effect on Southwest Conference play. In fact, they enjoyed their finest year ever against non-conference foes. That year, Southwest Conference teams went 27-4-2, the all-time highest out-of-conference winning percentage. In 1930, one of the greatest linemen of the Southwest Conference first 25 years, Barton Bocce Cook of Baylor became the first consensus All-American. 89 others would follow in his footsteps up to the 1995 season. In 1934, while the country was still digging its way out of the Great Depression, the Southwest Conference made its first big impact on the national scene. On October the 6th, Texas coached by ex-Notre Damer Jack Sheffy defeated Notre Dame 7-6 in South Bend. On that same day, Rice blanked Purdue 14 to nothing, and Southern Methodist tied a highly regarded LSU team 14-14. These events launched the Southwest Conference into the forefront of college football. By 1935, the Southwest Conference was producing teams that were really winning recognition coast to coast. But even before that, the league had come up with some individual standouts that no one could overlook. For instance, in 1927, TCU had an all-conference end named Rags Matthews. Rags played in the famed East-West Shrine game in San Francisco that year and played so well that a dozen years later, a San Francisco sports writer said that if permitted to pick an all-time, all-shrine game, his first choice would be Rags Matthews. Uh, Texas A&M had Joel Hunt, a marvelous uh, running back, and uh, SMU had Gerald Mann. And those two played so well that they became famed as the 
two lost All-Americans. That is, that they didn't make any of the official All-American teams, but they were true All-Americans. Arkansas had the league's first player to win some sort of All-America recognition and end Ware Schoonover, who once caught 13 passes in one game. And then in 1932, uh, the league uh, celebrated maybe it's one of its great, individual, uh, great uh, team showdowns, TCU versus Texas. Texas had three all-conference backs that year, Harrison Stafford, Bon Hilliard, and Ernie Coy. But TCU had six all-conference linemen, headed by All-America Johnny Vault. And when the best linemen played the best backs, well, you know who won. TCU won the game 14 to zero. The decade brought to the conference the likes of Madison Matty Bell who coached three of the Southwest Conference's most illustrious programs to prominence over a three-decade period. His 1935 Mustangs won the national championship with a 12-0 regular season mark. He gained notoriety by guiding SMU to four conference titles. He also coached the Southwest Conference's only entry in the Rose Bowl when SMU faced Stanford in 1936. I think what my dad would want said about his position with the Southwest Conference was that when he came to SMU in 34, he had an opportunity to do something really wonderful with a number of young men that were absolutely superior. Bobby Wilson, uh, Harry Shuford, Bob Finley. Some of those guys were just the neatest, greatest guys who went on to become wonderful citizens for Dallas. And then in 1940, when they shared the championship at the Southwest Conference, and of course, going into the Navy during the World War uh, II was a little respite there, but when he came back, he had Doak Walker and Kyle Rote and Dick McKissick and Paul Page and all those persons that were such wonderful, wonderful people for SMU and for the citizens that couldn't always be on the football field, but were people who wanted to play and wanted to have a good time. So I would have to say that he would think that he would want everyone to understand how lucky he was to be included in this group of people. In 1936, the Heisman Trophy was named for John Heisman, who coached Rice University during the 1920s and said to his everlasting discredit, you'll never have a great football team played by the Southwestern teams because the climate will not permit it. Little did he know that five players from the Southwest Conference would win the very award named for him. 1938 marked the year that TCU beat SMU 20-7 to clinch the national championship. TCU was led that year by Lil Davey O'Brien, who was 5'7 and weighed only 140 pounds. O'Brien became the first Heisman Trophy winner of the Southwest Conference that year and the first Heisman winner west of the Mississippi. The silver anniversary of the conference, 1939, produced an Associated Press national champion in Texas A&M with an 11-0 record under coach Homer Norton. Norton's so-called screwy defense used odd man lines and blitzing linebackers, a tactic that held opponents to an amazing 1.71 yards per game and NCAA record. To add emphasis to their super season, the Aggies then defeated national powerhouse Tulane 14-13 in the 1940 Sugar Bowl. In 1941, a pact between the Southwest Conference and the Cotton Bowl became a milestone in collegiate athletic history. This gridiron classic between the conference champion and a national power has produced battles for national supremacy and an always entertaining contest on New Year's Day. Until 1994, it was the oldest continuous contractual agreement between a bowl game and a conference. In the first Southwest Conference sanctioned Cotton Bowl, on January the 1st, 1941, Texas A&M accepted the invitation to play 12th ranked Fordham. The first Southwest Conference champion in the postseason classic, the Aggies rode a 62-yard scoring pass on the hideout play from Marion Pugh to Bama Smith to key a 13-12 victory before a sellout crowd of 45,507 the largest to see a game in the Southwest up to that time. For two seasons, 1943 and 1944, a manpower shortage caused by World War II forced Baylor to cancel its football program. 
In 1944, Coach Dutch Meyer's three one-and-one -one TCU Horn Frogs defeated Texas despite the play of talented freshman quarterback Bobby Lane. By 1944, the country was at war. Baylor had dropped football uh, temporarily because of a manpower shortage. TCU had won the national title in 1938, Texas A&M in 1939, and in 1941, Texas fielded one of the great enigmas in conference history. That Texas team was undefeated and untied through its first six games, became number one in the nation, never uh, gave up more than 14 points, never scored fewer than 34 points, and 14 of its players that year, or that week, were featured on the cover of Life magazine. It came to Waco to play a crippled Baylor team and was favored by up to 50 points. Well, Baylor tied that game 7-7, and uh, the Longhorns were so stunned that the next week, they lost to TCU, leaving their fans to wonder what in the world ever went wrong with the 41 Longhorns. Well, they regrouped and beat Texas A&M at Kyle Field for the first time and closed their season in thunderclap fashion, defeating a fine Oregon team 71 to 7. However, something happened the next day that uh, took a lot of the spotlight off that game. The next day was December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor. In its 34th year, the Southwest Conference's second Heisman Trophy winner, Doak Walker of SMU, sparked the Mustangs to a 9-1-1 mark. It was SMU's second straight and the first back-to-back -back conference titles in non-war years. Walker racked up 88 points, averaging 42.1 yards per punt. Return kickoffs and punts, it was also one of the conference's top defensive backs. I'll be honest with you, I don't think I knew that much about the Heisman Trophy. Uh, I don't even think I could spell it, uh, and I'm not sure I can today. But I think I have realized to appreciate it more uh, now than I did then. Uh, in the latter years, uh, the, of course, the media at that time uh, was oriented to the East, and uh, we didn't have television. And the way I learned about it was uh, through a telegram that went to Lester Jordan and, and Maddie Bell. And then uh, I think I was gone hunting or something and got back Monday and they told me that I had won the Hyben Trophy. And that I would be going to New York to receive it. And uh, uh, well, I was happy with the trophy, but I don't think I, I knew the magnitude of it then as I, as I have learned to accept and enjoy today. Forever linked to Walker was his teammate Kyle Rote. Rote shared Walker's speed and agility and had a knack for open field running. Though Walker earned a Heisman, to those that saw him play, Rote was a legend in his own right. In 1949, one of Coach Jess Neely's most outstanding Rice teams went unbeaten in Southwest Conference play. With the passing of Tobin Rote, and the receiving of Froggy Williams, the Owls went on to cap their season with a 27 to 13 win over a rugged North Carolina team led by Charlie Choo Choo Justice in the 1950 Cotton Bowl. Rice ended the season as the Associated Press's fifth ranked team with a 10 and one record and Froggy Williams became an All-American that year. In 1953, Rice and Texas battled for national and conference supremacy as the Owls and Longhorns tied for the conference's top spot. With the win over Texas, Rice headed for the Cotton Bowl to face Alabama, site of the most famous play in Rice football history. Leading 7-6, Rice halfback Dickie Magel took a handoff at his own five and raced around right in. With his blockers clearing the way, Magel appeared to be on a clear path to the end zone. As he approached midfield, Alabama captain Tommy Lewis ran onto the field and knocked Magel to the ground. Magel was awarded a 95-yard touchdown, the longest in Cotton Bowl history. Later, Lewis apologized to Magel and the Rice team at halftime. The play overshadowed Magel's amazing 265 yards on 11 carries, an incredible 24.1-yard average. In 1954, Coach Bowden Wyatt's second Arkansas team edged SMU for the conference title and allowed only 114 points in 11 games. 
The Razorbacks went on to the Cotton Bowl that year and played Bobby Dodge Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Dodge was assisted that year by a young coach, Frank Broyles, who would take the helm at Arkansas in 1958. In 1956, Texas A&M's Jack Pardee was the embodiment of every small town Texan's dream. Going from six-man football at Cristobal to defensive mainstay for Bear Bryant's Texas A&M Aggies. But while Pardee gained fame as a linebacker, he was a pretty fair fullback too, scoring the clenching TD at A&M's first win ever at Memorial Stadium. It was the only time a Bryant coach team beat the Longhorns. By 1956, the Southwest Conference had become well acquainted with such superstars of the previous decade as Doak Walker and Kyle Rode at SMU, Jim Swink at TCU, Larry Isbell at Baylor, uh, Weldon Humble and Dickie Magel at Rice, Clyde Scott at Arkansas, and Bobby Lane and Bud McFadden at Texas. The league also had become well acquainted with uh, uh, the name of a little hamlet in West Texas named Junction. That was where Bear Bryant, in 1954, took his first A&M team for uh, two a days in the hot, dry climate that was junction at that time. Uh, that Aggie team went on, didn't win a conference game that year, but two years later, with those junction survivors leading the way, the Aggie team did not lose a conference game. In 1956, uh, there were four reasons why we should remember the season in particular. Uh, one, that A&M championship team was on NCAA probation and thus became the first Southwest Conference championship team uh, to be unable to play in the Cotton Bowl. Then the runner-up TCU team did go to the Cotton Bowl in A&M's place and there beat a Syracuse team that was led by the great Jim Brown. The third place team that year in 1956, Baylor, went to the Sugar Bowl and upset a Tennessee team that was ranked number two in the nation and was led by its All-America tailback, Johnny Majors. And then a fourth thing happened that year. At the end of the season, Texas decided to change coaches. It said goodbye to Ed Price and welcomed to its midst a young coach named Darrell Royal, and things were never the same at Texas again. Nineteen fifty seven was a great year for Bear Bryant's Aggies. It produced the conference's third Heisman Trophy winner, John David Crow. 1957 also marked the last year of Bryant at A&M, who went on the following year to coach Alabama. The number one ranked Aggies were upset by Rice and later lost to Texas, but still went on to capture the conference title. Throughout the 30s, 40s, and early 50s, seven schools made up the crux of the conference until Texas Tech's entry in 1956. After years of failure, the school used its oil-produced clout to force its acceptance. Canceled Neiman Marcus credit cards arriving from West Texas gave Tech SMU's much-needed vote at the spring meetings in Fayetteville. In 1959, third-year Texas head coach Darrell Royal won his first of 11 Southwest Conference titles. In 1963, Texas captured the first of three national championships under Coach Royal and capped that honor with a rousing 28-6 Cotton Bowl victory over a Navy team led by Heisman Trophy winner Roger Staubach. You know, the first time you don't, I didn't know what, even what was happening. I didn't know how important the national championship was. I was just trying to win the next ball game. Then after you hear national champs, national champs, it sounds pretty good. So the second time that you pick one up, it's a little more satisfying. In that championship season, Texas was led by consensus All-American Scott Appleton. He anchored a Longhorn defense that allowed only 80 rushing yards and seven points per game in that impressive season. 1964 marked great seasons for both Darrell Royals Longhorns and Frank Royals Arkansas Razorbacks. Arkansas went 11-0 that year and then beat Nebraska in the Cotton Bowl to share the national title with Alabama. The Longhorns of Texas were 10 and 1, suffering their only defeat to Arkansas by a score of 14 to 13. The Horns then went on to defeat top-ranked Alabama in a 21 to 17 thriller in the Orange Bowl. No question, the dominant Southwest Conference teams of that era were Texas and Arkansas, and the games they produced quickly became known as classics. 1960, 1962, 64, 65, and later on. But there were some other games that were truly unforgettable as well. One came in 1963, 
SMU taking on a Navy team that featured Roger Staubach, and the game was played on a Friday night before the Texas-Oklahoma game the next day. In that game, SMU was, uh, was the great underdog, of course, <clears throat> but the Mustangs did win the game 34-28, to and it was a contest that was unforgettable. In 1963, uh, Texas was the national champion, but the Longhorns had to survive two particularly narrow escapes. Uh, one of them came in the 1963 game in Austin against Baylor, when Baylor had two All-Americans, Don Trula, quarterback, and Lawrence Elkins at end, and it took a uh, last gasp interception in the end zone for the Longhorns to survive 7-0. to And then in the final regular season game that year, uh, the Longhorns had to survive a series of near disasters to defeat Texas A&M 15 to 13. One game they did not survive came in 1961. They were undefeated, untied, ranked number one in the nation, and like the Longhorn team of 1941, they had not had a close game. They took on TCU in Austin that day, and the Longhorns were favored by 27 points. But uh, their great running back, James Saxton, their tailback, was knocked out of the contest early, and then TCU used a tricky uh, pass play from Sonny Gibbs to Buddy Isles to score a touchdown and knock one of Darrell Royal's greatest Longhorn teams out of a national title. In 1966, the first African-American scholarship in Southwest Conference history went to Jerry Levias. Levias justified the faith of the SMU coaching staff when he tied with current Mustang coach Tom Rossley for the national pass receiving title with 80 catches in 1968. The Beaumont native accounted for 1,131 receiving yards as a senior to pace the nation and to gain All-American laurels. The two-time All-Southwest Conference standout also led the Mustangs to a pair of bowl appearances. He notched 155 career receptions for 2,275 yards at a 14.7 yards per catch average. He was one of the Southwest Conference's most feared kick return men with a combined 147 punt and kickoff runbacks for 1,790 yards. Looking back on the situation, now I think of myself in that category as in Jackie Robinson as Rosa Park. Someone took the first step. But at the very beginning, that wasn't the idea. It was just the idea of going to school and getting an education. But looking back on the things that I've accomplished in the Southwest Conference and in college, I think about who was that young man that took all that abuse and was still able to perform. And looking back on the things that I went through, it helped make me stronger as an adult now because I can become more focused. And I don't see evil and I don't see a lot of the prejudice that still exists in a lot of people. I only look for the good. And I try to give that back to some of the youth and some of the people that I meet every day now. In 1968, a six-year dynasty at the top of the Southwest Conference ladder began for Texas as the Longhorns earned a Cotton Bowl berth over co-winner Arkansas by virtue of a 39-29 to explosion at Austin. Both teams later impressed fans and pollsters alike with wins over Tennessee 36-13 to in the Cotton Bowl by Texas and Arkansas defeating Georgia 16-2 to in the Sugar Bowl. You know, I hear these. I hear people that say they have goals and and what their goals were. And uh, they, after their success, they said they'd talk about setting goals. I, I never set any goals ever. And, you know, try to do better the next day. But as far as what I thought would happen to me, I thought upon graduation from college, I would be a high school coach. I'd be lucky to get in a, a good, solid. Uh, well-attended high school and I figured I'd be a high school coach. Uh, things just happened and uh, got breaks and I moved along, uh, played for an outstanding coach and, and Bud Wilkinson at the University of Oklahoma and we were in a new offense at that time which I was quarterbacking and it was called the split T and so I got uh, jobs and, and uh, assistance in college because I'd played quarterback for Bud Wilkinson and they were looking for someone that knew something about the split T. They didn't necessarily pick me, they picked a, a player of Bud Wilkinson's who knew something about the split T. And uh, that gave me my first start in college. 
but as far as predicting or setting a goal or uh, I no I've I lived I, I always said I just scratch where it itched and uh, you know if it scratch here scratch it you know it's there scratch it uh, a patch move uh, live from day to day I've you I never organized two practice sessions in a row you practice you, you wait until after you've played and practiced one day and then you make your next practice session for to cover things that you weren't doing poorly and, and we're doing poorly but as far as setting out to win X number of games or win so many conference champions or, or become a college head coach I never have been a goal setter I, I've, I've noticed these people that, that have success and they say my goal was to be here at a certain stage and there at a certain stage I don't know how they're that bright I don't know how they can see into the future on December the 6th, 1969, the Great Shootout. The game that looms is one of the greatest and most hyped confrontations in conference history. Texas came back to score twice in the fourth quarter to defeat Arkansas 15 to 14. This game has been ranked as one of the most exciting confrontations ever between a number one and number two in the annals of NCAA history. By the time the 1974 season rolled around, Texas had won or shared six straight Southwest Conference championships. Baylor was still locked in a football title drought that had lasted for 49 seasons. In 1973, Texas had gone to the Cotton Bowl and Baylor had failed to win a single Southwest Conference game. And in 1974, Texas again was favored to win the title and Baylor was favored to finish last. Well, Baylor instead constructed what became known as the miracle on the Brazos. It did so mainly by blocking a punt against Texas in the second half and using that play to trigger a huge comeback that wiped out a 24-7 deficit and led to a 34-24 victory. Uh, that victory led to a Baylor spurt at the end of the season that led them to the Cotton Bowl for the first time to play Penn State. That team, Cinderella team, had its special heroes, people like Neil Jeffrey, Steve Beard, Darrell Luce, Aubrey Schultz, and of course, Coach Grant Taft. Two other teams qualified as uh, Cinderella teams during that era. In 1966, SMU won a flock of last minute victories and went to the Cotton Bowl. And the next year, 1967, Texas A&M lost its first four games, appeared to be beaten again in the fifth game against Texas Tech, but instead scored on the last play of the game and did not lose again. Uh, that team led by Ed Hargett, and coached by Gene Stallings, one to, uh, on, on its way to the Cotton Bowl and there, in dramatic fashion, beat its old mentor, Bear Bryant, and his Alabama team uh, for one of a and all-time great victories. Nineteen seventy-six marked Houston's first year of competition in the conference and incredibly their first Southwest Conference title. The Cougars' Wilson Whitley won the Lombardi Award that year and was named Southwest Conference Player of the Decade. In 1978, Upstart Houston won its second conference gridiron championship in three tries by squeezing out a 7-1 mark over 6-2 Texas to prove that they were capable of competing strongly in the Southwest Conference. Well, there's no question that the, it was an extremely significant year, our first year into the conference, because the alumni and really the team and coach and everybody have been waiting for it for a very long time. So emotionally, uh, I think uh, I probably did as less, I did less getting a team up that year than I'd ever done in my whole life because you didn't have to do anything. What you had to do is keep their feet on the ground. And we had some great leaders in Whitley and Belcher uh, and Paul Humphrey, which uh, was a, a necessity. But really, uh, to, to, to try to gauge what, a, what a, something like that means uh, to a program is difficult. Uh, it, it provides you an acceptance in your recruiting situation that you had to have. It provided, you know, it got rid of the BO, you know, in the state. And also, it, it, uh, uh, an exceptional amount of significance was attached to it outside the state of Texas and outside the Southwest Conference. So, that, that first year was very, very meaningful uh, to the program and, of course, to the coaches and players. And in a game that would again showcase the competitive and wacky spirit of the Cotton Bowl, 
Coach Bill Yeoman piloted the Cougars to a 34-12 advantage over rugged Notre Dame through three quarters of the frozen 1979 Cotton Bowl. But the Irish came back to win it in the final seconds, 35-34. Well, there isn't any question that that was probably one of the worst uh, defeats that I can ever remember as a football coach to the Notre Dame game. But when I saw Joe Montana do it to, to the likes of the Dallas Cowboys and everybody else, you know, uh, what I figured he should have paid me some money for really training him to do all this. But he is a great athlete. Notre Dame is a great uh, uh, program, have been through the years, and it's a situation where you just don't let up. Our kids have not been used to, to hunkering down on a, on a team like Notre Dame and understanding that until the final whistle blown, it, 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 nothing meant anything. So I, I mean, I'd competed against Notre Dame at Michigan State for seven years, so I had some idea of what in the world I was talking about. But it was just hard to explain to the kids. The weather was so miserable. They were looking for an excuse to, you know, to celebrate and all this kind of stuff. So it was a premature celebration, and it was, a, you know, and even with all of that, for crying out loud, the little youngster that caught the pass for the touchdown w went to the East-West game uh, the next week where I had to put up with him. But he said he caught the ball two yards out of bounds, and he did. But, you know, it's the way it goes. Texas appeared bound for the Cotton Bowl and Baylor for oblivion when they met on November the 25th, 1978 at Baylor Stadium. In the dressing room shortly before kickoff, in an often repeated but mistold story, Grant Taft fired up his troops by chomping on a worm. Of course, it had to do with uh, basically two fishermen that uh, were fishing on ice, one catching fish, the other not catching fish. And the fisherman that was not catching fish said to the guy catching fish, what is the secret to your success? And he said, you got to keep the worms warm. I used that story during the week to illustrate to the players that they had to do whatever it took, do the extra thing, even if it was keeping the worms warm. So before the game, I said, guys, the game is yours. All I can do is stand on the sideline and keep the worms warm. That's the story. Baylor thrashed Texas 38-14. In 1983, a powerful defense led Texas to a 10-0 regular season record. Ranked number two, Texas traveled to Dallas to face eighth-ranked Georgia in the Cotton Bowl. Although their offense sputtered, the Longhorn defense managed to keep Texas ahead 9-3 late in the fourth quarter. Facing 4th and 17, Georgia punter Chip Andrews kicked a wobbler that Texas Craig Curry was unable to handle. Georgia recovered at the Texas 23 and three plays later scored on a quarterback keeper to win 10-9. Texas had fumbled away its second opportunity for a national championship in six years. The football era that began in 1974 and ended in 1984 featured a lot of the University of Houston, of course, and Bill Yeoman's famed Veer offense. It also featured SMU teams that were led by uh, Lance McElhaney, Craig James, and Eric Dickerson, and established themselves as outstanding teams in 1981 and 82. In 1980, Baylor won its second title in just six years and did so in emphatic fashion, winning the title by a record tying three full games. In 1976, Texas Tech won its first share of a Southwest Conference title as its quarterback, Rodney Allison, made a bushel of big plays. And then in 1977, everyone got an eye full of, of one of the football's all-time great backs, Earl Campbell, who won the Heisman Trophy and did everything for the Longhorns except pump up the football. He did so for a Texas team that was coached by Fred Akers, because by then, one of the most dramatic evenings of football in the Southwest Conference has ever offered. Uh, Texas's Darrell Royal and Arkansas's Frank Broyles sent their teams against each other for the last time, and then both Hall of Fame coaches retired. <clears throat> for those of us who were there, it was something we could never forget. Nineteen eighty-five marked the resurgence of Texas A and M as a Southwest Conference power and began a decade of dominance for the Aggies. Jackie Sherrill's troops finished 10-2-0, with their only losses coming in the season opener to 20th-ranked Alabama and a heartbreaker to Baylor in Waco. 
Making their first Cotton Bowl appearance in 18 years, Texas A&M faced 16th ranked Auburn, armed with Heisman Trophy winner Bo Jackson. Jackson gained 129 yards on 31 carries, but was stymied at the Aggie goal line at the beginning of the fourth quarter. A&M then pulled away to a 36-16 victory. The Aggies became the first Southwest Conference team to average 200 yards per game, both rushing and passing. Texas A&M would win five Southwest Conference titles in the next eight years. I think the thing that really made it special uh, went back right at the end of the 84 season. Uh, toward the end, we had really a tough season in 84, but we had some young players who were getting better each week, and uh, we ended up that year beating Texas and Austin in a uh, heck of a game. Really good performance by our team. We, we had all those guys coming back, so we knew we'd be a good team in 85. We had guys Johnny Holland, Larry Kelm, Todd Howard, uh, 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 Roger Vick. We had Bernstein. We had uh, Kevin Murray. It had just a real collection of athletes on both sides of the ball, and uh, we knew we'd be good that year. Uh, the conference was strong that year. We got out. I remember one game in particular where we was playing SMU, who was good uh, in that season, and we kicked a long field goal late in the game and uh, beat them, and that kind of got us over the hump and uh, went to Dallas, played a, a real good Auburn team in the Cotton Bowl. Uh, Bo Jackson, the Heisman Trophy winner that year, was uh, on Auburn's squad, and I, I've got a picture here on my office wall of the fourth and two goal line stand that the wrecking crew made against Bo Jackson, stopped him, and AM won that game. In 1989, Arkansas won its second consecutive and last Southwest Conference title. In August the following year, the Razorbacks, a charter member in the Southwest Conference, announced that they would join the Southeastern Conference after the 1991 football season. Some say this was the beginning of the end of the Southwest Conference. It was gaudy and obnoxious, but for five years under Jack Pardee and John Jenkins, the run and shoot was the most amazing aerial circus college football has ever seen. From 1989 to 1992, the University of Houston led the nation in passing offense under quarterbacks Andre Ware and brothers David and Jimmy Klingler. Six times a U of H receiver led the nation in catches. The run and shoot reached its zenith on October the 21st, 1989. That's when the Cougars pounded SMU's rebuilt Mustangs 95 to 21 while rolling up 771 passing yards. On October the 16th, 1994, before a national television audience, Rice ended a 28-year drought against the Longhorns by defeating Texas 19 to 17. The swarming out defense stymied the Longhorns on a rain-soaked field by holding Texas to 179 total yards and only 16 on the ground. It was the first Rice victory over Texas since 1965 and the first at Rice Stadium since 1960. Rice shared in two other firsts in 1994. Five Southwest Conference teams shared the title for the first time ever and Rice was at the top of the conference for the first time since 1957. So as we prepare to ring down the final curtain on the Southwest Conference, how shall we remember the Grand Ole League? Well, it pioneered the use of the forward pass. It gave us the wishbone offense. And of course, it gave us a full quota of superstars. Joel Hunt, Bocce Cook, Sammy Ball, uh, Bobby Lane, John Kimbrough, Doak Walker, John David Crow, Earl Campbell. Well, the list just goes on and on. And in the last 10 years, uh, we've had, a, again, a full quota of outstanding performances and games, many of them wrapped in Aggie maroon and white, and often featuring what has come to be known as the Aggie wrecking crew with its great linebackers. Uh, we should note that uh, if not for the Arkansas teams of 1988 and 89 and the Texas team of 1990, Texas A&M would have won nine straight titles. And they're saying that the best is yet to be. Certainly for Coach R.C. Slocum, dynasty has become a favorite word. From football legends such as Daryl Royal, Matty Bell, and DX Bible, to Olympic champions Carl Lewis and Michael Johnson, to NBA world champion team members Hakeem Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler, to Women's Basketball Players of the Year, Cammie Etheridge and Cheryl Swoops. 
the Southwest Conference has produced many exciting moments in intercollegiate athletics. Throughout 80 years of competition, the Southwest Conference, with its many great athletic programs, has provided many thrilling memories in all sports. Yet to many, football is definitely its legacy.